Hey everyone, it's Peter Kerr from Rock Day Dream Nation. And today I've got a couple of guests to the channel. I've got John Clauser from My Music Corner and Peter Wicks. Welcome back, mate, to the channel from Wixie Leaks. Hey, today we are going to talk about a band that was one of the forefathers of the new wave of British heavy metal. And I'm talking about Raven. But we're going to cover their 1986 album, The Pack Is Back. So this show is going to be kind of a pseudo in defense of or just free form. We're just going to talk about what we like about the album, what we don't like. This album came out in 1986 and was a bit of a commercial flop. It was their second album where they were recording on the Atlantic label. It was produced by Eddie Kramer, big heavy hitter, Eddie Kramer, Kiss, Zeppelin, Hendrix, Need I Say No More. This album's talked about a lot. In uh, with a lot of metal fans as not being that good. But, hey, the whole purpose of this show is maybe we do a little bit of a rear guard defence and we talk about the positives of this album. So I might throw it to you, Mr John Clauser. Tell us about your impressions of The Packers Back and, um, yeah, we'll take it from there. Boy, uh, man, my impressions. I, I remember this when it came out and it was... I mean, okay, it was. I was still kind of new to Raven at that point in my life, so um, I liked it. I gravitated to it pretty quickly. Uh, the title track to me is one of my favorite Raven tracks of all time. I, I love the title track. Um, I, I just I, there's something about something in the lyrics that just really spoke to me, and uh, just really it was it just it, especially as a teenager, it really gets you fired up, you know. So that's how I always approach that. Um, you know, you you I I didn't get to I, when you hear when you hear an album like um, this was my introduction live at live at the Inferno. So you have that frenetic energy of that, and then you get this more polished sound. It was a little different, but I still liked it. So. Um, but the title track to me is always was always was uh, one of my favorites. Um, I didn't mind the horns. Um, I don't know if we'll go into that. How we'll yeah. get into that? But uh, we'll, we'll go into the songs. But uh, okay, John, thank you. That's like your yeah. first impressions. Um, Pete, yeah. over to you. What was your first impressions in the day <laughs> when you heard this album? So 1986. Well, I was I'd, I'd been a Raven fan for a while uh, when it came out, and um, most most people I knew weren't. Um, um, I got into them with All For One, which I still rank as one of my favourite albums. I think that's an absolute ripper of an album. Um, so w when it came out, I was a bit, um, I wasn't quite sure what to think at first. Um, the horns, obviously, were, were a bit of a like, wow, what the hell's this? Um, um, certainly the first, the, the title track, yep, that's, that's a, a, a great thumping song. Um, it, I don't know, I was a little bit um, taken aback because... Coming from All For One, which um, is really well produced to sound not well produced at all, like if you know what I mean. Like they've, it just sounds as raw as anything, whereas All For One just sounded really like they've gone overboard with the polish and it was just, it was it was like um, they wanted to hit an American audience that were into Motley Crue and, and bands like that. It, was, it, it sounded to me a lot more commercial. But it doesn't mean I didn't like it. Um, and clearly, from the cover, you can see their, you know, the jeans are gone, and there's and they're, and they're in costumes. I mean, another drummer always wore a hockey mask, but yeah. so you're talking um, about the Packers back here. The Packers back, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. They, so, you know, they're busting out of the, the, yeah. the lockers or whatever, and they're in the, yeah, yeah in the in the gear. So it, it, it just, yeah, <laughs> like that. Even upside down, they still were. <laughs> yeah. So whereas before it was, you know, your typical, just looked like, you know, a regular regular band jeans t-shirts type thing so yeah yes sans costume so yeah it, uh, it, to me it was obviously going to be more commercial um and i guess that that was a bit of a put off but it doesn't mean i didn't like it so yeah, yeah. okay well, my first impressions were actually you in the day, because I used to hang out with you in around 1986, was you got me onto this band and mm -hmm. the there were a couple of tracks that I really gravitated to and Hyperactive was one of the songs that I thought was just so catchy because mm -hmm. you had a metal band that had a horn section 
and it had a little bit of bit of groove to it. So um, yeah, I I really like this album. It got played a hell of a lot in the day. I, I recognise for what it was. It wasn't a perfect album. It has some flaws, and we'll talk about this as we go deeper into the conversation. But I really, really liked it, and this was kind of a entry point for me. And then I went back in time and listened to those early albums like Rock Until You Drop and Wiped Out, and wow, what great albums! Mm. And you can see that um, a lot of metal bands really stole their licks because they were like at the mm. forefront of the speed metal movement. Um, new wave of British heavy metal, and you look at some of the tours they did, Metallica supported them. A lot of those big metal bands that went on to greater success arguably stole a lot of their licks because those first couple of hours were mighty fine. But, yeah, this is very polished, and I did, didn't did mind it at all, and it was my entry point, thanks to you, Peter Wicks. You're That's welcome. why we got you on the show. All right. Mr. Clouser, John Clouser. So why don't you highlight, let's highlight a couple of songs one at a time and you just okay. maybe put a spotlight on and we can just uh, get into the album from there. Right. So, so, so one song that's just been like in my head when I started really kind of listen to this thing again. Uh, I, one of the catchy songs on this thing for me is Screaming Down the House. Um, to me, to me, the, that's the third track on the uh, on the on side A. Um, I don't know. There's just there's that feel of you know screaming down the house. You never should have left us alone. I love that lyric. You know, again, it just screams that uh, you know that wild danger kind of thing that you kind of had in some of those first couple of Raven albums, but you just got a little more of a polished sound with it. And of course, you got these great gang vocals, which I thought was which is just is all over this album. And uh, that's that hook and that and that chorus has just been just been reverberating in my head uh, quite a lot uh, over the last week or so. Um, I think oh, let's see what what other songs should I talk about? I, I think I'll I think I'll leave the elephant in the room for for one of you guys because I'll, I'll I'll be curious to hear what you guys think about that. But uh, let's go. I'll I'll just talk about Rock Dogs side the side B opener. Another just good thumping. Maybe not quite a fast song, but it's got that nice thumping intro. Again, you got these gang vocals. It just makes you just want to scream and shout throughout the ent- throughout the entire song. And uh, those songs just really just kind of get stuck inside you. You know, I've already mentioned the great the pack is back as being one of my favorites, but boy, screaming down the house and rock dogs really kind of reaching up there too for me. So, uh, um. You know, the uh, one other thing I, w- I would love to mention is just Mark. To me, Mark Mark has just got some really tasty licks in this whole on this whole album. Yeah. Okay. Nice start, John. Pete, um, what uh, song or songs you want to put a spotlight on? Um, well, <laughs> along the same lines as John, actually, um, uh, Rock Dogs is is probably probably my favourite track on the album. I think, um, line ball between that and the other one I'll mention. Um, yeah, Rock Dogs has just got that really grungy guitar sound at the, like they've, you know, turned the tone right down and it's just real grungy at the, at the start, which, which reminded me a lot more of their early days with the, with that. And then you've got the driving, the, the driving bass line. Um, uh, yeah, and also subject matter, like, like Rock Dogs is very much like their old style lyrics, you know, like, mind over metal and athletic rock and stuff like that. Right, rock dogs just fit it into that slot for me. Um, the other one I'll, I'll mention, and I'm not sure if this is the elephant in the room that you were talking about, um, uh, Give Me Some Lovin'. Is that the, yeah, uh, uh, awesome cover. Like really, really belts it out. Like I still listen to that regularly today. It's um, it's probably the best cover of that song I've ever heard. So, um, yeah, they, they, they own it. They own that. I own that song when they do it. It's um, excellent. So, yeah, track two. They ravenized it. Yeah, yeah, they did. And it's, it's got the thumping bass and the big drums and the, um, yeah, it's just, and, you know, and he's, I don't know, how, how would you describe his, his, his scream? It's not like a normal scream. It sounds like a, an old woman howling or something. I don't, it's quite an unusual, it's quite, quite an unusual when he yells. It's, um, yeah. It's, but uh, it works. It does. It works so well. It's just completely unique. And he can still do it. 
<laughs> which, you know, Indeed. he Indeed. can still do it, which is the amazing part after all these years. Unlike the other Gallagher brothers from the UK. Uh, yes. <laughs> who, who just want to argue all the time. Yes, yes. <laughs> these these Gallaghers are still uh, rocking That's and right. going out and touring. Gallagher's like those can other still get Gallagher's. along. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> who, would have, who would have thought? <laughs> Kumbaya. Kumbaya. Yeah. Mm. Um, all right. Thanks, Pete. Um, I think the songs that work the best are the less conventional rock songs. So, as I said earlier, I love Hyperactive. I mm. think that is just like Earworm and the horn <laughs> section. And they, this is Brave, a metal band putting a horn section before Aerosmith did with Permanent Vacation, which came out in 87, and Motley Crue with um, Dr. Feelgood. There's a few horn sections on, on that uh, album. I think it was Slice of My Pie or whatever it was. But metal bands after this album, you know, uh, were starting to use different instrumentation and horn sections. So I think it's really brave. I think it's such a catchy, catchy song. But it's not anything like the old Raven, the original um, <laughs> new wave of British heavy metal. It's like kind of pseudo pop rock. And if they didn't have that strong imagery, um, you know, mm. the athletic rock or whatever, it, which is a bit daffy, um, <laughs> if they had that a different sort of image, it could have well charted. It could have been on MTV. It's it's a what if type of episode. Mm. Um I also like Don't Let It Die. It's got a bit yeah. of bit of um, Motown groove. You know, you've got the horn section. Mm -hmm. I know it's like a James Bond type. Um, it, goes it reminds into me of a James middle, Bond it? theme. Yes, it does. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's got a bit of sass about it. And, um, yeah, this is a band that's experimenting. Um, look, the band hates this album. They really do. And they I think it's, it, yeah, they said it's, the you know, they were signed to Atlantic and Atlantic really wanted to corporatize them and obviously get them radio airplay, and they polished mm. everything about Raven. Now, I love the old Raven, but this is this album I really, really enjoy, but maybe if they were under a different name or started afresh, it may have been a, a different sort of uh, mm. story whatsoever. I agree with the gang vocals because let's face it, John Gallagher hasn't got a great voice. So I think the best way to um, get that commercial sound and get the audience is due to the gang vocals. Mm. Um, so it sort of covers that like up, it. papers it up. <coughs> oh, look, I'm saying when he, no, I'm no, saying he hasn't got a good voice, he's not like a Robert Plant or a David no, no, Coverdale. No, 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 no. He, he's got the growl and to, to yeah. make it sound melodic. And I've actually noted there are some songs here where you can, he almost sings and is starting to sound like a singer, but mm. he's not quite at that level. So I reckon Eddie Kramer would have been pushing him very hard in, in the studio. Um, I love the drumming. I, I think Wacko, um, you know, is a Rob Wacko Hunter. His drumming is really, really good. All these little nifty fills and... Yeah. Um, it, it's He's almost the most valuable player, in my opinion. He really just pushes it along. Yeah. Um, the production is really clean. It's very 1980s, and you expect that with Eddie yeah. Kramer. That's like a heavy hitter. Mm. So they've really polished up the sound. Um, yeah. Um, I remember that a lot of other bands were doing polishing up, like even Judas Priest with the turbo and, and all that sort of stuff. At, at the time, everyone was sort of polishing their sound and becoming yes. more commercial. Uh, really Quiet great. Riot with that three album, which was mm. just uh, washed in synth. Um, it was like they were drowning in synth. Um, yeah, Some they, they were really sort of commercialising. But this this mm. album has got some mighty fine songs. For me, the first three don't work for me. The pack is back. Sounds like the, the song's almost falling apart. Um, Give Me Some Loving, I find very weak. Oh. Screaming Down the House um, is kind of average. I think the track listing from Young Blood Only is when it gets better. And it moves into overdrive. So I think every sort of song from Young Blood down to Nightmare Ride is where um, it's really stellar Raven. But that's just my my opinion. Hmm. John, okay. any other songs you want to sort of pros or cons, or any other songs you want to sort of highlight? Oh, let's see. I think I think I think the thing I think people need to kind of understand about this album is it really I think shows a little bit more of 
their influences. Um, you know, and uh, and I'll I'm going to flash this thing up here for 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 those of you who are lucky to have this little this little fun thing, which Peter, you just got a copy of it. Just, uh, <laughs> but uh, this is a little cover CD these guys did. You know, where they're covering people, you know, bands like Deep Purple and David Bowie and Slade, uh, even Cheap Trick and Status Quo. So they're, I think, I really think this album was just a way of showing their influences, but yet staying in that, in their sound, but also melding in that product of the times of the 80s, you know, where everything was getting so polished and so you know, so clean and polished and stuff. So that's kind of where I think it's so, so songs like to me, like, like lung, like uh, young blood or um, cause young blood's got a lot of good, good riffs going on in there. You also got that. Um, you also have that, uh, that guitar synth solo going on in there. So that's, that's certainly a product of the times. Um, you know, we've already talked about uh, hyperactive and don't let it die. You know, all I want, I think, is another great track. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Nightmare Ride, good album closer. Those last two, I think, kind of, kind of harken back to the Raven of old. It just sounds a little bit more cleaned up. Okay, right. thanks, John. Pete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, all I want's another one of those, one of those songs that that does sound very like, very much like Raven of old, except without ex- extremely polished, obviously. Not not as raw, but it's 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 got the same sort of riffs, um, vocals, and whatnot. It's, it's just in the same style of, of old. Um, so that sort of reminds you of what they what they were like before this album, I suppose. Um, Hyperactive is would obviously be another one, uh, and that was the first time I, I, I think I'd heard horns used in a in a certainly in a metal album. It's yeah. Um, it's yeah, and and it was sort of like. I remember the first time I heard it, and I'm like, "What the hell is this? What what the hell's going on here?" That was on your <laughs> ski compilation um, tape, was it? Remember it? Oh yes, it God, was. Yes, was ski trip. we were going on a ski trip, and I remember that was in the cassette. You know how you make mixtapes, and yeah. Hyperactive was on the um, on the on your yeah. compilation. So made there you the go. mixtape cut. Jeez, I'm, yeah. I'm surprised you remember much of that trip. Actually, I'm, <laughs> I'm surprised I am. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm surprised we survived it, um, but yeah, yeah. Hyperactive is up. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's fast. It's, uh, it's yeah. It's 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 as the name suggests. It's quite hypo. Um, yeah, I just it's um. I just I mean, when I got it, I loved it. I mean, everything was everything was changing. It's it's not one of the it's not one of the um, albums I go I'd be go if I go back to one of their albums. It's definitely all for one. Um, but uh, yeah, it's. Yeah, and I totally disagree with you on the "Give Me Some Love," and I think it. Oh, I think, it's awesome. I think that's I think that's the, a bit weak. I think yeah. the bass, the bass in it is um is good, and it's sort of got a sense of humour about it as yeah, well. It, to me, it sounds a bit three quarter pace and lethargic. Um, mm. It should be "Give Me Some Loving" is like a punchy Motown mm. sort of uh, soul sort of influence song. It's got a da 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 da, you know, yeah. you know, like in the Blues Brothers. It's it's got to have a be ramped up, but they're just playing a three quarter pace. It's like you can imagine Wacko's just on the drums and he's, you know, it, it just needs a little bit of a rev up. It, it's not revved up enough. It's mm. just it's too mid paced, and you can see it's the obvious commercial decision, corporate. Yes. Let's yeah. throw a, a cover, and cover. that was well, going to be the really angle. well known cover, yeah. And that was going to be the angle to sell this album. So, yeah. but it's just my opinion. Um, yeah, all I want, great song. Um, that yeah. and I agree with you. The last two songs, <laughs> all I want and Nightmare Ride, are a return <laughs> to the um, the early days of their uh, <laughs> their sound. So you can imagine there might have been a little bit of mm, angst in the um the studio and they were sort of fighting come on let's we've got to retain yeah, and have some of those old days. songs yeah. yeah as as part of it but um what do you think of the Im- i think we've touched on it and let's talk about it again but um what do you think of the imagery here and i've got to show you something don't you reckon he looks like glenn tipton <laughs> i've always <laughs> thought that uh he's like a doppelganger yeah, maybe glenn a little tipton. bit yeah what, what's yeah. glenn tipton doing in the band she whiz. And this guy, who's this wacko? He looks like he just came off the set of Mad Max 2 or The Road Warrior. <laughs> right, yeah. It can, it he can always looked like wild. that, though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he did always look like that, yeah. 
And then you've got um, you know, nice cod piece. Um, anyway, <laughs> it's, it's yeah, I don't know. It, it, it's very spinal tap, isn't it? It's just um, I don't know. It's funny how they uh, they they in that in that era they tried so hard to look so tough, but ended up looking camp. It's um, it, well, it's know, taking it, it's taking that athletic rock thing to a different level. That's right, and and actually showing the athletic rock, you know, breaking out of the the uh, the locker rooms and stuff like that. What is athletic rock? Can please somebody explain it? I've been trying to research. What what is the definition? Did Wacko smash his drums up? Was that part of the um part of his um? Because he he looks like he'd be the drummer at the end of it. He'd, he'd do it like a a, a a Keith Moon and just smash the drums up, the, Cra- at, crash at tackle it or something. Kind of like what they do on the like. You can see at the back of the <laughs> of yeah. the of the uh, live of the Inferno uh, album there, yeah. where he's about to toss the drum, the kick drum into yeah. the. Yeah, I mean we're audience. laughing. He's a great. He, he, oh, he the, certainly the is. The drumming yeah, yeah. is really really solid, and as I said in a recent show uh, with I had with John, he's actually into production. He does engineering, so he went from you know playing the the drums into hmm. um, that side of the business, which is quite interesting. But um, yeah. with one of the Marcellus like brothers, you, you, you said you saw them like when they toured Australia. What, what, what were they like live now? Great. They were, yeah. they were, they had a different drummer mm. and um, they play a lot of the early stuff, mm. but they're really kind of full on. Um, they've got that really aggressive, hard speed type of edge to it. Mm. There was, there's none of this polish, there's no mid pace. It was kind of really full on. So, you see that with a lot of bands. They start off in a certain style of music, then they have the mid part of their career. They go commercial, they try to smooth it, and then it doesn't work, and then they go back full circle. So yeah. that's what's happened with this band. Yeah. yeah. But they're, they're kind of really solid. I'll be interested to hear the new album. I'll, I'll certainly give it a listen. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. When, when I compare... Sp- oh, sorry, John. I was going to say, when I saw them recently, uh, this was like last October, this was like last November. Um, they did the wiped out album in its entirety. And wow. they did, and then they did like a few other, uh, they did a couple of older tracks. They did a couple of tracks from Metal City. And then uh, they ended off with, uh, uh, they finished the set off with Mind Over Metal, which I thought was really hmm. a surprise to a bunch of people because I don't think they expected that to come out uh, that night. But uh, yeah, no, they did, they did wiped out in its entirety. That was the tour they were doing at the time, so uh, it sounded it sounded fantastic. the the new dr- The new drummer they've had for the last uh, couple of albums is is really really solid. Uh, you know, the guy they had before him, uh, he who took over on uh, "Nothing Exceeds Like Success" uh, or "Like Excess." You know, he was there for a long time, and he was he was just as good a drummer too. Uh, I think he just had to retire for personal or health reasons or something but but this new kid they got mike heller he's he's fantastic he yeah, just, well, just, it's 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 like when it's like when scott travis joined joined judas priest you know and, and you you heard you heard how painkiller was it just seems like when when mike took over on metal city and this new album it was just like yeah well if you're wow. a power trio it's really important that you have a drummer really just powers it along look at all the power trios that you know yeah. in history police nirvana yeah just power mm. you've got to have a, a really good drummer yeah but um pete interesting because i know you very well mm. with raven you, after that your musical taste you were very much into slayer anthrax metallica obviously yeah um, I didn't hear much raven from you. So, in a way, did you sort of like shed your clothes with this album and just went on to new adventures? Because I think a lot of people may have just sort of, because of this album, just moved on to new yeah, musical uh, adventures. Well, I mean, I first I first got into I, I first got into them. I think someone from Utopia Records might have said, "Hey, you should check this album out. This album is really good," and that was mm. all for one. And I think when they when they went commercial, yeah, I was getting more into Slayer and and stuff like stuff like that. Um, and, and you didn't hear so much of Raven because, like, despite them trying to be commercial, they never really, never really made it. So um, it's not like the other 
more commercial bands like Motley Crue, if they bought out a new album, you'd know, you knew it was out. If Metallica mm. bought out a new album, you knew it was coming out. Raven, you didn't hear anything about. Like hardly anybody in Australia knew who they were. So I, I guess I just missed it. It wasn't anything intentional or anything like that. I guess yeah. I, I just missed it. Well, yeah. My my feeling to that is when this came out, nothing exceeds like excess. That they by that point they're off Atlantic, and they're now on combat. Combat eventually kind of goes belly up, and then they get on some smaller labels out of out of Europe, and you know albums like like this or everything louder. You know, there's certain albums that they're just not easy to come by. Mm. Um, very very hard to come by because they were on small labels, and of course it also doesn't help that. Mark was involved with an and like a, an accident where like a retaining wall fell down on top of him and did a number to his legs. So he he it took him out of action for a while. Um, and so they were they were they just weren't around for I forget when they came back around. But I think just getting on small labels and just not getting out, not getting that notice. That's yeah. why nobody heard of them, especially in the nineties. Well, yeah. and and also a lot of the um, press that we got over here in, into that in that sort of scene into into metal and whatnot was American press, and they were a British band, and I think they they got missed a lot by the American press just for that reason. So we didn't read anything about them over here, or mm. I, I don't think I ever saw them in a. I think I think I saw them maybe once in a in a magazine. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely, so. but. It's interesting, uh, a similar sort of story to Anvil. Uh, a lot of people can yes. um, compare them to Anvil, but um, I, I rate them much more highly um, from a musicology point of view um, because Raven actually originated in 1974 and they were kind of hard rock. So I think their pedigree is much stronger than um, Anvil, but not to offend anybody, but it's that's just my opinion. No. Um I really think that uh, the tight, you know, like in the 90s, you're right, John, um, metal was going through a bit of a rough scene uh, because the the changes of music culture were definitely leaning to alternative music and grunge and new metal, and that sort of style of music um, is, was seen as a bit twee. But everything comes back in cycles, and there's certainly a market for, for Raven. But it's interesting, like, Raven... You know, when they were the uh, sort of part of the new wave of British heavy metal movement and you had up and coming bands like Metallica supporting them, where was Metallica offering Raven a support gig? Um, that's the thing that I find quite intriguing. And especially in that Anvil documentary where you've got Lars saying Anvil were a big influence on us and blah, blah, blah. Did they ever put Anvil on a support tour? No. No. So it's, yeah, I, I sort of, you know, if if you really believe in them and they were an influence, why wouldn't you bring them out on tour and, and give them a little bit of a, a leg up? I mean, they supported you. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Mini yeah. rant there. Good point. It, is, it, it is a head scratcher, but at least at least Metallica did ask them to, hey, can you guys open up for that John and Marsha's Azula Memorial thing, and uh, which they did. So... At least they got to do that, but I mean, come on, who wouldn't want to see another kill them all for one, re, you know, fortieth anniversary tour? Come on, absolutely, there'd, there'd be yeah. a market. Um, but uh, look, this uh, album, yeah, sorry, Pete. No, I was say, at least at least Metallica wore a lot of Faith No More shirts and got us into them. <laughs> oh, look, yeah, look, you got to hand it like with their cover albums, they got a lot of folk into a, a lot of different oh, sort of yeah. genres, a lot of different types of um, music, like budgie. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, full full credit to them, Diamond Head. Ah, you know, <laughs> anyway. So, I think we all agree this is a solid album, it shouldn't be reviled like it is. And I think a lot of albums get reviled because it's a change of sound. Mm -hmm. And you know, if uh, people are used to a particular sound or a particular type of rock, and the band just you know shifts the notch to the left or the right or whatever, um they get offended and don't like it. So I don't think the um, the critical disdain for this album is warranted. 
And I think we all agree it's pretty solid. It's got some good stuff on it. But it's not a perfect album, but it shouldn't be sort of uh, regarded as bad um, as some people say. So, John, um, do you want to have any closing words? We'll just do a roundabout. Closing words. Oh, gosh. I mean, if 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 you didn't, if, if Pack is Back isn't for you, then go go to the early stuff. If you could track the later stuff, certainly do it, especially Metal City, the new one, Extermination. Those are probably the easiest to come by. But do yourself a favor and go go dig in, dig deep into the catalog. You will not regret it. Okay. And Pete, any final words? Um, I'd, I'd say most people would would say that when when in that era bands went um, went start to go commercial um, that it that it lacked guts. Um, I would say this is actually a gutsy album. Um, they've they've gone with the introduction of horns. They've they've really gone places where you wouldn't expect them to go and I think that's really gutsy and I definitely think it's worth a listen. Absolutely. I agree with you. Artistically gutsy mm-hmm. um, yeah. and um, not not a total sellout and, um, you know, there's enough crunch in the guitars, you know. Um, there's some mm-hmm. wood lead breaks. There's a lot ACDC type gritty crunch mm-hmm. and um, enough for the, the rock listeners and people that, you know, maybe have a little bit more of a commercial sensibility. Thank you, my friends. This is a good little bit of a roundabout. So John Clouser, you can see him on My Music Corner. Lots of great content. I'll always promote his shows because they're ace. Peter Wicks, Wixy Leaks, he's all part of the family and we'll have him on another show very soon. So tell us what you think about Raven, the Packers back. Do you think it's a dog's breakfast or do you like it? Put your comments. Please like and subscribe to Rock Day Dream Nation and we will do a show very soon. Cheers.